What's up, Mission? How's everybody doing today? Good afternoon. I want to welcome those of you that are also in the lobby, out on the patio, or online right now. Um, it's just really good to be together. Uh, my name is Jody Hickerson, and I am stoked to be kicking off a brand new series today that we are calling Moral of the Story. Anybody remember those stories that we heard as kids? Um, Aesop's Fables, and um, they've been adapted a whole bunch of times. Any, tortoise in the Hare, anyone? Tortoise in the Hare, yes. Um, what about the Lion and the Mouse? Mouse, lion in the mouse. Um, the one that gave me nightmares, the boy who cried wolf. Did anybody, yeah, that one, it was like, you really shouldn't lie, you know? Um, I mean, that one was terrifying. But all of these stories, you know, had a meaning. There was a moral to the story. They had a lesson attached to them. And here's the deal. We remember the lesson because of the story. Like, stories are powerful. Neurological research shows that we remember stories a lot better than we remember facts. Like they just have a way of capturing our imagination, but also like our heart and mind attaches to an idea at the same time. Like stories are the most powerful tool in marketing. And um, in sales, stories are what get passed down in families, right? From generation to generation, there's nothing like a good story. And when Jesus walked the planet, man, he was a masterful storyteller. Jesus often taught um, by using parables, and what a parable is, it's a short story that has a metaphorical analogy um, that teaches us something. But here's the deal about Jesus teaching parables. When Jesus walked the planet, he was God, like he was God in the flesh. So he didn't just teach parables to give us like nice little lessons, like be kind and don't procrastinate. <laughs> when Jesus told parables, they included deep truths. Like the parables of Jesus, what he was talking about, mere deep spiritual realities. Like Jesus was illustrating truths about who he was. He was illustrating truths about who God is, what God is like, what the kingdom of God is like all about. And we see this all throughout the teachings of Jesus. We have 40 different parables um, recorded in the New Testament that Jesus, that Jesus said. Those are just the ones that got written down. It seemed like when Jesus was teaching, he would often do this. He would often look and go, it's kind of like that shepherd over there. It's kind of like that field over there. It's kind of like that seed. It's kind of like that mountain. And he would use stories so that people would remember. And here's what's so powerful. Here's what's so powerful. These words of Jesus, these stories from Jesus. They have the power to reach through 2,000 years of history into our lives today. And so we're going to jump right in. I'm really stoked over the next five weeks as we're going to dive into some of these parables. But I want to give us a little backstory um, leading up to what's going on um, before Jesus tells this particular parable. And you can read all about the life of Jesus in the biographies of Jesus. So the first four books of the New Testament, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. It's a great place to start to kind of like read what was his life all about. But if we look in the Gospels at what's going on in this life, Jesus is like started his public ministry. and He's traveling around to all these little fishing villages at the time, and he's got four followers. So he's got four disciples, four guys that he has so far called to follow him. It's Peter, Andrew, James, and John. And they're traveling on these fishing villages, and they come to a city called Capernaum. And at Capernaum, they see someone they know. They see a guy named Levi, who's also known as Matthew. And Matthew was a tax collector, which basically means Matthew was a traitor, to his own people, like really bad reputation. That's why Peter, Andrew, James, and John knew who he was. They knew who his dad was. They knew that he was no good. And they, they all knew that. So when Jesus stops near where Matthew is collecting taxes and cheating people, Peter is like, yeah, I know, right? He's the worst. <laughs> like that guy, everybody hates that guy. And so when Jesus stops and he leans in, Peter's like, oh, I got to see this. Like, how is this going to go down? But what Jesus does is he looks at Matthew and he leans in and he says, follow me. And you know that like Peter, Andrew, James, and John had to be thinking, that guy? Like, seriously? Like, I'm not sure if we're going to keep following you if that guy follows you. Because that guy is like an embarrassment to the family. This is a traitor. This is a guy that is up to no good. And look, he's like out here in public. Like, he's doing it in front of everybody. Jesus, are, do you have no standards? Like, are there no restrictions as to who you would invite to follow you? And let me just 
answer that question from the life of Jesus for all of us today because it's really good news. No. The invitation to follow Jesus is for anyone. And it is for every one of us here today. So Matthew takes Jesus up on his offer. Matthew says yes to an invitation that would change his life forever. He had no idea in the moment what hung in the balance of saying yes to that decision, but it's changed his life forever. And Peter, Andrew, James, and John, you know, they were like, they had seen too much. They believed Jesus who was who he said he was. And so they're like, I guess we're just, I guess we go with this now. Okay. And so I don't know how the conversation went down, but Jesus says to Matthew, follow me. And Matthew says, okay, I'll leave everything and I'll follow you. Where are we going? And Jesus is like, I thought we'd go to your house first. And Matthew's like, okay, cool. And so they go to Matthew's house and Matthew invites a bunch of his people over. Guys, a bunch of other tax collectors and, and notorious sinners bunch of people come to Matthew's house to hang out with Jesus and his now five followers. And, and this was like, they were just hanging out, they were eating, they were drinking. And y'all, for a rabbi, like, like for a rabbi like Jesus, for a religious leader, this was wrong on so many levels. He was hanging out with the wrong people. He was having dinner at the wrong house. This, when you had dinner at someone's house, it was like intimate. It was like symbolic. And everybody in the town knew where everybody was eating because these were small towns. Everyone knew what was going down at Matthew's house and who was there, including the Pharisees. Now, the Pharisees of the day were the religious elite of the time. They were actually the legal experts in like the law of God from the Old Testament. They were enforcers of this law. They had like a lot of influence, like a lot of authority um, in society. And they have been, they have been shadowing Jesus for a while. So they're following him as he's traveling to all these fishing villages. They're staying on his heels um, because this guy, Jesus, was just like so disruptive. Like everything that he was doing was new. Everybody say new. New. And they didn't like it one bit. So they're following him, these religious leaders, but like to keep an eye on him. They're trying to catch him, like doing something wrong, trying to trap him, trying to discredit him because they didn't like all the new. They had their old ways. They had their laws. They had their rules. They had their moral code of how they decided who was in with God and who was not. So when you've got this guy, Jesus, showing up and claiming to be, you know, sent by God, the son of God, the exact representation of what God is like, but he's not fitting into any of the ways that they had done things, it was disruptive. I mean, even leading up to this moment at Matthew's house, as they're following him around, they see Jesus chooses some fishermen to call him and, and to, come to, to come to him to follow him. He chooses some fishermen, like ordinary, uneducated guys. And the religious leaders see this and they're like, wait, what? He's not supposed to choose those guys. And Jesus is saying, it's a new day. I've got a new plan. From there, he goes on to heal a man with leprosy, like an outcast to society who's been driven away from his family. And the religious leaders are going, wait, what? He's, he, he's not supposed to touch people like that. And Jesus is like, it's a new day. I've got a new way. From there, he heals a man that was paralyzed. And then after healing him, Jesus sees his actual inner need, his heart, and Jesus tells him that his sins have been forgiven. And they're like, wait, what? He can't forgive sin. And Jesus is like, it's a new day. I've got a new power. And so now he goes and recruits a tax collector, a crooked cheat to be his follower. And Matthew says, yes, I'm down. And then they go to Matthew's house and all of these people come over and he's at this house with all of these friends. And the, the Pharisees are literally like, what is going on? You're not doing anything right. In fact, they come to him and they say, why do you eat and drink with such scum? I mean, come on, you're not supposed to be hanging with people like that. And Jesus says, it's a new day. I am making a new community. Get this, where anyone is welcome and no one is perfect, but change is possible through the invitation of Jesus Christ. There is hope for everyone. And so after the party at Matthew's house, the religious leaders, they're all shook up. They come to Jesus and they start questioning him, questioning him on like how he's not doing things right, the Sabbath, fasting, all of these things that he's not keeping in their way. And so Jesus gives them this illustration, which is our parable for today. He says this, no one tears a piece of cloth from a new garment and uses it to patch an old garment. 
For the new garment would be ruined, and the new patch wouldn't even match the old garment. Now, when Jesus told these parables, he was using illustrations that would be like super like common for the people like listening in that day. So he's saying something that like everybody knows. They're all like, yes, of course, this is common sense. Everybody knows, you know, better than to do that. And here's why it was so common. In ancient times, people didn't throw away their clothes. Clothes were very expensive. So if you got something ripped or or torn, you weren't getting rid of it. You weren't giving it to someone else. You were patching it. And he says, you know, like everybody knows, right? You never, never take a new piece of garment that has never been washed, so that's unshrunk fabric, and patch it onto something that's shrunk fabric. Like this material's already been washed, and so it's shrunk, so you can't take from something new that hasn't been shrunk and and then try to patch on the old. Otherwise, it's just going to tear away. They're going to tear away from each other. It's going to make the tear worse, and plus you just ruined your new garment. So it's like a lose-lose, and everybody listening are like, yes, of course. Like you're pretty much telling us something we've known since we could remember knowing anything. Like everybody knows this, and And Jesus says, okay, let me tell you something else you all already know too. And no one, no one puts new wine into old wineskins. For new wine would burst the wineskins, spilling the wine and ruining the skins. New wine must be stored in new wineskins. But no one who drinks the old wine seems to want the new wine. The old is just fine, they say. Again, they all knew this. They're like, yeah, no one does this. No one puts new wine into old wineskins. For us, though, right, this isn't common knowledge. So let me just show you a picture of what um, a wineskin back in the day looked like. It's made out of animal skin. It kind of reminds me of like one of the Lululemon crossbody bags, but for wine, okay? They were just, that's how they were rolling. Um, And everybody knew. Here's what was common knowledge. When you have new wine, you can't put it into, you have to put it into a new wineskin because the fermentation process is still happening. Like gases are still escaping. This is something that's still swelling. And so if you put it into a new wineskin, that's the only wineskin that's going to be flexible enough and pliable enough and soft enough and expandable enough to expand with the process of fermentation. But if you put that new wine that's still going through this process into an old wineskin, one that's already been formed, one that's already hardened, and those gases start expanding like it literally can't contain it. It, it breaks, it bursts open and you lose both the wine and the wine skin. It's a, it's a lose, lose. And everybody's like, yeah, of course, we all know this, right? So what's the point? And Jesus is addressing these leaders saying, I am the new. I know you all have a way of doing things. I know there's been a lot of history and a lot of tradition and a lot of rituals and a lot of rules, and I'm not even saying that it's all bad. I just want you to know that I am the new. I am actually the fulfillment of the law, and I am doing something new. Do you not perceive it? And everything they had seen and heard as they followed Jesus around this new teaching This new way, this new community, this new power, this new message. It was all a part of the new. Jesus was the new wine. Jesus was the new cloth. And by giving them a mental image of like the the torn garment and the bursting wine sins, he is sending a clear message that you cannot just add him to what has already been. And you cannot get him to blend into what's already going on in the cultural system. You cannot pour what he came to do into a container you've already developed. He's come to do something brand new. It's a new day. There is a new way. And let me tell you, they had a, they had a hard time with it. They eventually killed him for it. Because they didn't really want what I honestly think a lot of us, if we're honest, don't really want either. I think we have a hard, I'll speak for myself, I think I have a, I know I have a really hard time with change. And some of you may be like, not me, I'm like early adopter type, you know, you say you love change, you know, but for the majority of people, um, like normal people, like change is really hard. And I would, I would guess, like, even if you are, like, early adopter, I would venture to say that all of us are resistant to change somewhere in some part of our lives. 
I'm not sure how many of you remember this. How many of you guys were alive in 1985? Okay, some of us here. Okay, cool. Um, you, maybe you don't remember 1985, but in 1985, Coca-Cola just like owned the market on soda, okay? When it came to soda, it was Coca-Cola. And then over the 10 years leading up to 1985, they started seeing their market shares like drop just a little bit and just a little bit because they had a little competition with this brand called Pepsi. And so they were like, what do we do? We need to figure something out. We have to compete better with Pepsi. Y'all, they came up with an idea. They spent so much time and so much money on this. And what they did was they developed a new formula for Coca-Cola and uh, like a new taste, something that would taste better than Pepsi. They actually blind taste tested 200,000 people. Okay, so they were wanted to be sure. And over and over and over again, they found that this new formula of Coca-Cola was beating Pepsi in the blind taste test, like over and over. So they're like, we got it. Like, let's run with it. And so on April 23rd, 1985, New Coke launched. How many of you ever heard of New Coke? You know how long it lasted? 77 days. Like it has literally gone down as one of the most colossal failures in any product's history. It's been called the marketing blunder of the century because turns out people were real passionate about their Coca-Cola. And over those 77 days, they received 8,000 calls a day from people who were just like angry. They were just angry. There were protests outside of Coca-Cola plants. There were people pouring new Coke down the sewers of Seattle. Entire stadiums would boo if a new Coke ad came on the Jumbotron. They received 40,000 complaint letters. And some of the stuff people wrote was just hilarious. I wrote some of these down. One guy wrote, it's like spitting on the American flag. Coca-Cola has violated my freedom of choice. It's Magna Carta. It's like the Declaration of Independence. Another guy, there are only two things in my life that really matter, God and Coca-Cola. And now you have taken one of those things from me. And, my, and one of my favorites is the signs. The signs that people held up at the protests said, our children will never know refreshments. <laughs> like people were so passionate about this. And listen, Coca-Cola had done the research. They knew what won the taste test, but they came to conclude why it failed so coloss colossally. It wasn't the taste, it was the word new. It was change, and you just don't go changing somebody's Coca-Cola. <laughs> and I'll tell you, we don't do change or new very well. Historically speaking, I'll just say it. I'll just say this. Church people can be the worst. Like, if we are not careful, we can miss Jesus right in front of us and what he's doing and the ways that he's working because we can become so set in our ways and so brittle and so focused on the rules and who's keeping them and who's not, and we can become legalistic and rigid. And maybe, maybe that's been your experience, like with church or with Christians. And man, if that's you, I just want to say, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. God's commands, like God's ways, they're important. I mean, Jesus isn't saying they aren't, but get this. God did not create us so that he would have someone to follow his rules. His commands are for us because he is for us. He is for you and you're flourishing. And when we get that backwards, man, we are missing it and we can actually cause harm. In fact, when you read through the life of Jesus, when religious people use the law of God to manipulate or shame people made in the image of God, Jesus made it very clear they were on the wrong side of God. Because Jesus came to bring a new, a what? A new way of connecting with God, being in relationship with God. And it was, y'all, it was an invitation to come. Like, just follow me. Embrace this new way of living, this new direction, this new love of God that is in Christ that we talked about last week. That following Jesus is much more about transformation, not behavior modification. It is an inside-out kind of thing, not an outside 
in kind of thing. And we have to remember this. We have to get this right because if we make it all about what we do and don't do instead of what's going on inside of us and Jesus actually transforming the container, we will end up giving up because it's just too hard. Or we get really good at faking it instead of really changing. It's an inside out kind of thing that comes from relationship with Jesus. 2 Corinthians 5, 17. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, the new creation has come. The old is gone. The new is here. That's the kind of transformation Jesus wants to do in the world and in your life. Something new, a real transformation from the inside out. And as I was studying this parable this week and looking at these words of Jesus and just how powerful it is that he wants to do something new, I started feeling like, man, I too can get really resistant to him What changing. Don't mess with me, you know. Container's good. I don't need you to do anything else. And so I thought it might be helpful for us just to walk through just a few things that came to my mind and my heart that that maybe it would be helpful for all of us to be challenged by or to process this week or to bring to God for our transformation. The first thing is this. I just want to encourage us all to completely surrender. Like to surrender absolutely completely, just like Matthew. Every single one of us has an invitation from Jesus to follow Jesus. And my encouragement for all of us is that we'd say yes. And surrender completely to Jesus. Not like put a toe in, like do a cannonball. Like go all in with Jesus to completely surrender. Because here's the deal. He did not come to be a patch job on your life. He is not someone you can blend into your old ways of living. And for some of us, we want Jesus. Like we want a relationship with Jesus, but we just don't want to give him it all. We just don't really want him to change the container. And so we just try to fit him into our old ways or blend him into whatever else we believe. We just fit him into a little bit of what we already think or what we already know or our worldview. But listen, it, like, it won't work. You cannot put him in a box. He is offering you something better. And it, it involves complete surrender to letting him lead your life. And I know, like, I know complete surrender is not easy and change is hard. And I promise you, trust me, I know this, his love and grace will be with you all along the way because it's not about getting it perfectly. It's about surrendering completely. And then we begin to experience this new life, this new wine that comes out of our lives. Because when we say yes to following him, we get a new identity. We also get a new master, new desires, new purpose, new meaning, and a new way to live. Surrender completely. Don't try to make him a patch job or blend him into your ways. And pursue new, not just next. I know for me, I, I really oftentimes want God just to tell me what's next. <laughs> Wouldn't that be nice? Like, God, could you just do that? And that's not a wrong desire to want God to show you what's next, to allow God to lead you to what's next. But here's the deal. I sometimes get so focused on the next that I miss the new that God wants to do in me right now. Like, right now. Something my dad told me a long time ago is that who you are becoming is more important than where you go or what you do. And I'm telling you, I'm, I'm a slow learner because I can get really stuck on thinking about, but what am I going to do next? And where am I going to go next? That I forget about the who am I becoming part? I actually think for so many of us, when we think about change and transformation and who we're becoming, we kind of can confuse next and new. I mean, for some of us, when we think about a relationship with God, like surrendering completely to Jesus, what we just talked about, we think like, oh yeah, I'll do that someday. Like, I'll, I'll change when blank. I'll change when I'm older. I'll change when things settle down. I'll, I'll change when I find the right person. I'll change when I have kids. I'll change when the kids are gone. I'll change when I get out on my own. I'll change when we move to that place, when I get that job, when I switch schools. I'll change when this season is over. But here's the age-old truth. Wherever you go, there you are. <laughs> and so if we aren't allowing God to do something new in us, 
right now, we may end up being the same person with the same old stuff when we're older. (laughs) When we're in that next city, that next relationship, that next job, that next school, that next season of life. So let's open ourselves up now. Let's be pliable now. Let's be moldable now. Let's be transforming now so that we might be becoming the kind of person that God wants us to be for whatever is next. Don't wait. Don't miss Jesus right in front of you wanting to do something in you right now in this season. Who you are becoming is more important than where you go or what you do. And let's not get complacent. I don't know if you caught it, but at the end of Jesus' parable, he just throws this in there. But no one who drinks the old wine seems to want the new wine. The old is just fine, they say. And for some of us, Maybe specifically for some of us that maybe have said yes to Jesus a long time ago, we are, we are, we are just fine. <laughs> we are just fine with what God already did. We are not interested in anything new God is doing. And for those of us that are relying on, like, I'm just fine. I don't want God to mess with me anymore. I did that a long time ago. And listen, what God has done in our lives, the way that Jesus has saved us, that is amazing. That will always be amazing. We don't, like, throw that out. Those are faith-building moments. And just like old wine, they get stronger and stronger with time. It's incredible. But if we are not open to God doing anything new in us, Anything new in our hearts, anything new in our marriages, anything new in our relationships, anything new in our friendships, we can just get so complacent and rely on what he's already done and say, like, I'm good, I'm fine. I like it this way. Instead of continually being transformed to become more and more like Jesus. Because, you know, transformation is not a, it's not a one-time thing. It is an ongoing process from the inside out where our capacity expands for more love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, and self-control to be in us and flow out of us. So listen, man, if you've been a Christian for a long time, when was the last time you asked Jesus to show you something new, teach you something new, lead you to something new, show you something new, give you passion for something new, courage for something new? Isaiah 43, forget the former things. Don't dwell on the past. See, I am doing a new thing. Now it springs up. Do you not perceive it? Can you not see it? May we be people that see it and people that want it. And lastly, this one is a little bit cautionary, but also it's some really good news. We have to remember the source of the new. Remember the source of the new. Jesus is the new cloth. Jesus is the new wine. And there is a difference between accepting the new that Jesus wants to do in our lives and then just looking for new in all the wrong places. Like in the same way that Jesus did not come to be a patch job on our lives or something we can just blend into our ways, everything new that comes along in religion or psychology or philosophy or culture or theology doesn't mean it's Jesus. Just because it's new doesn't mean it's him. And sometimes this parable gets taken out of context. And it's like, if we're not adopting everything that's new, we must be brittle, hard wineskins. That's why we got to remember the source. We got to remember who it is we're following. It's Jesus. So as followers of him, we are looking to him. We're looking to what he said, how he lived, how he loved, what he did. He is the source of new. And so often, I think we forget this. Like, I know I do. And I just am like, I got to pursue a new thing and a new thing to see if maybe this new thing will fill us or this new thing will satisfy us or this new thing will give us a new way of life. And if I could just quote the great TLC, don't go chasing waterfalls, okay? There is nothing out there, nothing new out there that you could have, that you could experience, that you could practice, that you could participate in that is better than him. He is the new. He is the source of the new, new freedom, new peace, new security, and it is good. The new wine is good. I don't know if you know this, but Jesus' first miracle was turning water into wine. He's at a wedding, and they run out of wine, and his mom comes to him, and she's like, you got to do something. We're out of wine. And so Jesus turns water into wine. 
And it's the end of the night. And so they take this, this water that's been turned into wine to the master of the, of the whole wedding. And he doesn't know where it came from, but he tastes it. And he calls the bridegroom over and he says, hey, so everyone brings out the choice wine first. And then the cheaper wine after the guests have had too much to drink. But you have saved the best till now. The new wine is good. He is better than anything else we could go after. Man, I want this for you more than anything because we can get so caught up in just trying to find that new thing that will satisfy. And I've just been praying what the psalmist prayed in Psalm 34, 8. I, I want us all to just taste and see that the Lord is good. <laughs> Try him. Pursue him. Say yes to him. Go after him. Spend time with him. Spend time in his word. Taste and see. Because we do not follow a dead religion. We follow a risen Savior. And we do not have a bunch of old rules that make us right with God. We have a living hope, and his name is Jesus. And the moral of the story today is that Jesus came to be the new in our lives. Will we receive him and the new transforming work he wants to do in us? Lord, I pray that we will. I pray that even now, even now, as your spirit is here present, we would open our hearts to be pliable and flexible and moldable and open to you. Would you speak to us? Would you remind us of who you are? Father, we love you and we are just, we are just completely surrendered today to anything you want to do. Have your way. Have your way in us. In Jesus' name, amen.